Hello, welcome to Baltic World. I'm Chris Byrne. And I'm Charlene. Welcome to part four of our History of Lithuania video. If you've been with us so far on this journey, we've covered the ancient Baltic tribes, medieval Lithuania, and the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth. This period covers an extraordinary time when Lithuania is suffering under occupation from the Russian Empire, managing to preserve its traditions, language, and culture, despite a systematic attempt to stamp it out. We're covering from the collapse of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at the end of the 18th century, right through to the restoration of the Lithuanian independence in 1919. We hope you enjoy. While the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was among the most successful political unions in history, in 1764, the Tsarina of Russia, Catherine II, managed to have her lover Stanislav August Poniatowski made King of Poland and Grand Duke of Lithuania. This provoked an anti-Russian rebellion in Poland known as the Confederation of Bar. This was a league of Polish and Lithuanian nobles who wanted to defend their independence and the primacy of the Roman Catholic Church. The Bar Confederation, with some support from France and Austria, ultimately brought about a war between Russia and the Ottoman Empire in 1768 due to the latter's support for the rebels. The war did not go well for the Ottomans, and Frederick II of Prussia and Maria Theresa of Austria began to worry about how a Russian victory would severely upset the balance of power in Central and Eastern Europe. This led to the First Partition of Poland, which aimed to avoid the escalation of the russo turkic War and improve Austro-Russian relations. Frederick II convinced Russian ruler Catherine II to focus on the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth as they were seen as weak and dysfunctional due to ongoing civil strife. Russian, Prussian and Austrian troops took advantage of this and marched in seizing territory. Lithuania lost large parts of Latvian, Ukrainian and Belarusian lands. The second partition started on the 22nd of May 1792. Two Russian armies marched into the Grand Duchy of Lithuania under the order of Catherine II who was furious at the proposed May 3rd constitution of the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth. The constitution was an agreement made by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth to introduce a constitutional monarchy and support rights of its citizens with more freedom, political equality, as well as religious tolerance. In fact, this Enlightenment-era revolutionary document was one of the first of its kind in Europe, modelled on America's Declaration of Independence. Meanwhile, Catherine II was a strong believer in the divine right of royalty and felt threatened by what she had seen in the French Revolution fearing that she would lose power and influence over the Polish-Lithuanian region. The Russian Empress was in alliance with the King of Prussia and they signed joint agreements to oppose together any reforms in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This spurred the Polish-Lithuanian-Russian War of 1792, where Catherine ordered troops to annex most of Western Ukraine, known as the Tawika Confederation, and Prussia took much of Western Poland. Followed were two further significant petitions of the Commonwealth. King Monatowski of the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth uh, was under siege in Warsaw and believed that if he surrendered early, he could prevent total defeat and negotiate a settlement. However, he was wrong. This led to the second petition of the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth with much greater territorial losses. Russia gained a vast area of eastern Poland, extended southward nearly to the Black Sea, while Prussia doubled its lands from the first petition, naming it South Prussia and gaining the port of Gdansk, renamed Danzig. The constitution of 3rd of May 1791 was also rescinded. This shocked some nobles who thought by supporting the Targowica Confederation they were preserving and defending their magnate privileges and culture, when in fact they were just realising that they were supporting the advancement of the Russian Empire and the weakening of their Commonwealth. In response to the Second Partition, there was a national uprising to fight against Russian occupation. In 1794, the uprising was led by the legendary Polish officer Tadeusz Kosciuszko, a veteran of the Continental Army in the American Revolutionary War. During this time, there were also the Vilnius Uprising led by Jakub Yuzinski, a soldier of the Polish Lithuania Commonwealth. However, the rebels were heavily outnumbered. The people of Vilnius, including its nobility, dug defensive trenches near the city, anticipating the return of Russian soldiers. They soon came in two armies, 8,000 and 12,000 strong respectively. Unable to withstand such an onslaught, Vilnius surrendered quickly. After a series of battles, Kosciuszko was captured, and on 24th of October 1795, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth 
dissolved, signing an agreement known as the Third Partition of Poland. As a result, the land of the Polish-Lithuanian king was replaced by the Russian Tsar, and lands were divided under areas of Russian rule and areas ruled by the Kingdom of Prussia. Prussia occupied land southwest of the Nemus River, and Russia basically got everything else. As a result of the petition, it wiped the Commonwealth off the map of Europe. Lithuanians and Poles looked west for hope, for liberation and independence, particularly the French Napoleon Empire, which at the time was sweeping military victories across Europe. Many Lithuanians fled to train in the French army, with some estimates it to be in the thousands, with at least two Lithuanians becoming generals in Napoleon's Grand Army. The Lithuanians fighting in the Napoleonic army enjoyed many victories against Prussia, Austrians and Russia. In 1806, under the German campaign, they were able to retake former Commonwealth regions annexed by Prussia. Military victories led to peace negotiations between France, Italy and Russia called the Treaty of Tilsit, which was an agreement to not trade with Britain. During this time, there was some discussion among Lithuanian delegates to revolt against Russia with French support, but Napoleon wasn't interested. Lithuanians grew really despondent at this lack of French support, but there was new hope when Napoleon decided to create the Duchy of Warsaw from recaptured Commonwealth lands. It didn't mean a fully independent state, but rather an allied state under French rule, which aided food supply to French armies who were fighting Russians in East Prussia, and the Minister of War was appointed to Prince Joseph Ponowski, the nephew of the last king and Grand Duke of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. While Alexander I was in Vilnius, Napoleon was preparing an attack. Napoleon had an army of 600,000 men ready to invade Russia. The Grand Army had advanced on four major fronts from the shores of the Baltic Sea to the banks of the Vistula River. On the 23rd of June, 1812, Napoleon crossed the Musa River and charged into Lithuania towards Kalinus. He anticipated that he could force Alexander into making peace, but within 24 hours after hearing of the invasion, Alexander I already fled. There was no formal declaration of war as Napoleon wanted to secure his forces in former Lithuanian lands and prepare for a proper conquest of Russia. Lithuanians saw Napoleon as a hero. Vilnius, Grodno and Minsk were all quickly captured by the French. When Napoleon secured his military in the north and east of Vilnius, Napoleon established a provisional government for Lithuania with senior nobles on the 1st of July 1812. He established the provisional government for the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which consisted of four departments, Vilnius, Grodno, Minsk and Bialystok, governing 17 regions of Lithuania, supposedly liberated by the French army. The provisional government was intended to be autonomous, but Napoleon also imposed a French shadow military government. Vilnius became the headquarters and a provisional capital of France with all French military governors. Lithuanians were provided sub-prefect roles. This dual government system led to extremely slow processes and was really unable to keep up the demands of the military. As the French army pushed into Russia, there were significant food supply shortages and poor access to clean water. Many Lithuanians fell sick with thousands of soldiers and civilians often lying in hospital camps in poor conditions and sadly passed away. As time went on, political leaders were raising their eyebrows when Lithuania would be liberated and even for the prospect of re-establishing the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and emancipating the serfs. After all, many Lithuanian noblemen continued to fund Napoleon's military operations with this in mind. But it was clear that the formation of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania was only seen as a military tool to advance further into Russian territory. In fact, when political leaders from Poland and Lithuania were negotiating the re-establishment of the Commonwealth, Napoleon vetoed the reunion. He was afraid of consequences from his Austrian and Prussian allies, as well as the possible infighting between Lithuania and Poland for selecting their monarch. With all these factors at play, enthusiasm among the Lithuanians to fight alongside the French quickly dried up. Fewer and fewer Lithuanians volunteered themselves 
when Napoleon called for troops leaving weak regiments. Nevertheless, thousands of Lithuanians participated in battles up until the very end of Napoleon's failed Russia campaign. After the fall of Napoleon, the victorious powers agreed at the Congress of Vienna that Lithuania would fall under Russian rule. Initially, Alexander I was fairly mild in his rule, introducing the Polish constitution. The new Polish constitution granted significant political and civil rights to the Poles and Lithuanians, including their own parliament, a constitutional monarchy, and the abolition of serfdom. The constitution recognized the rights of habeas corpus, protection against unlawful and indefinite imprisonment, freedom of religion, and the press. It reserved Polish and Lithuanian government posts and the recognition of Polish as the official language of the Polish kingdom. Surprising as it may seem, given what has happened since, at that time, Poland and Lithuania enjoyed greater autonomy than any other former conquered Napoleon territory. However, it would not last long. While the constitution of the Kingdom of Poland and Lithuania was established with the promise of its own laws and autonomy from the rest of Russia, the King of Russia, Alexander I, ultimately had autocratic powers and wanted no restrictions to his rule. He installed his younger brother, Konstantin Pavlovich, as the governor of the Kingdom of Poland responsible for militarization and the discipline to maintain order within the kingdom. Pavlovich, like many other Russians, was not interested in following the constitution of the Kingdom of Poland. He believed that the constitution provided too much freedom to the Poles and Lithuanians and did not give the Russians enough power to control the region. There were also some Russians who wanted to take revenge on the Lithuanians who supported Napoleon's war against Russia, especially Russian commander of Vilnius, General Levetsky. Konstantin Pavlovich as governor made efforts to quickly roll any political and civil rights back, including restricting the freedom of the press, limiting autonomy of the Polish government, and restricting the rights of Polish and Lithuanian nobility. The Russian governor also replaced Polish and Lithuanians with Russians in important administration roles within the kingdom. In 1819, Alexander I introduced greater censorship and the Russian secret police, which monitored any political activity and alerted authorities to any threats. Many Polish and Lithuanian people who spoke out against the Russian Empire were persecuted. In 1821, the Russian Tsar ordered the abolishment of any elite society comprised mainly of Polish and Lithuanian nobles and gentry, given the fears that they could start social liberation movements. Members of these societies still met in secret. After the death of Alexander I, his successor, Tsar Nicholas I of Russia, formally crowned himself King of Poland, replacing his uncle Konstantin, who abdicated in 1825. In 1828, a group of cadets from Warsaw planned to overthrow Russian rule. The final straw was when the young cadets heard that the Russians were planning to send Lithuanian and Polish soldiers to put a stop to France's July Revolution and the Belgian Revolution. This was against their own principles and a clear violation of the Polish constitution. The young officers led by Petra Wozoki took weapons and attacked the Belvedere Palace with attempts to assassinate the governor of the Kingdom of Poland, Konstantin. Konstantin narrowly escaped and the Russian army was forced to withdraw from Warsaw. While the insurgency enjoyed some initial success in the northern section of Warsaw, the Polish army failed to break Russian resistance, losing major battles in Ostrolaika. The Polish army had to withdraw into Prussia and Warsaw fell again under Russian control. A key figure of history from the November uprising was Emilia Plater. Born into a noble family in Vilnius, Lithuania, she was trained in fencing, shooting and horse riding from a very young age, which was very unusual for this time period. When the uprising broke out, she wanted to join her fellow patriots but was immediately rejected for being a girl. Instead of accepting this, Amelia concealed her gender by cutting her long hair and wearing male uniforms. She successfully gathered 280 infantry, 60 cavalry and several hundred peasants, equipping them with scythes. She led her regiment through several successful battles. She became a captain and a commanding officer of the 1st Company of Lithuanian 25th Infantry Regiment, the highest rank ever awarded to a woman during that time. Amelia Plater's courage and leadership is admired by many to this day. She is seen as a maiden warrior, a national heroine, and a significant symbol of independence that is commemorated in both Lithuania and Poland. After the November uprising of 1830, the Russian Empire implemented a policy of Russification in Lithuania. 
This involved suppressing native language and culture and limiting Lithuanian political and cultural autonomy. The use of the Lithuanian language in public life was restricted and the education system was reformed to emphasize Russian language and culture. Lithuanian cultural institutions were suppressed or banned, including the closure of Vilnius University, one of the oldest universities in Eastern Europe. Many Lithuanian intellectuals and activists were either exiled or imprisoned. In response to the ongoing Russification policies, another uprising took place from January 1863 to 1864. This time, it was a grassroots movement across the region led by several factions and groups rather than a single leader, which aimed to restore the independence of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Initially, the rebels were successful in capturing several key cities and towns, but ultimately, they were defeated by Russian forces. Although these uprisings failed, the November and January uprising had a significant impact on the Lithuanian national identity and future movements. These uprisings were seen as a symbol of resistance against foreign oppression, struggle for national liberation and self-determination. The shared desire for independence and a strong national pride continued to grow in the following decades and eventually played a key role in re-establishing an independent Lithuania after World War I. Around the time of the January uprising, Russian military officer Mikhail Nikolaevich Muriov was appointed as Governor General of Vilnius to enact harsh Russification policies against Lithuanians who stood up against the Russian government. He was nicknamed the Hangman. Under his order, there were mass executions, often in public spaces, to intimidate and deter other Lithuanians from joining the uprising. Land and property was confiscated from Lithuanians, particularly from those who were linked to or suspected of supporting the rebellion. The Russian governor also implemented forced mandatory conscription of young Lithuanian men to Russian armies in order to weaken the rebel forces. He banned Lithuanian culture and language in books and newspapers, ordering that Russian be the official language of the region. The attempt to erase Lithuanian's identity is encapsulated in the quote, what Russian rifles did not succeed in doing will be finished off by Russian schools. The Lithuanian language was also banned in legal proceedings, which included abolishing the Lithuanian legal code that defended and protected the human rights of Lithuanian citizens. As a result of the harsh Russification policies, many Lithuanians were executed and over 12,000 were exiled to Siberia. Today, many Lithuanians view Muriov, a staunch Russian oppressor and a key symbol in history for the struggle of Lithuanian independence. At this point, it might seem all was lost for Lithuania. They lost their lands, their freedom, their language, and their strongest men. Why then was Lithuania's culture not completely eradicated? By the mid-19th century, the restoration of the Russian beginnings policy was enacted, which essentially stated all Lithuanian and Polish lands were Russian, and therefore Russia reserved the right to claim and adopt Russian language and culture in the region. Lithuanian language was banned in all books, newspapers, and schools. Everything was converted from Latin to Russian Cyrillic for the next 40 years. In order to preserve their language, ordinary Lithuanian citizens started a grassroots educational movement initially led by Mortiegius Valentius called Schools of the Hearth. These schools were decentralized across many villages and run by local teachers secretly in their homes. However, to avoid bringing attention to Russian authorities, Lithuanian children were told by their parents to still attend Russian schools and then after hours attend Lithuanian school to get the real education. In addition to the schools of the hearth, Mortiegius Valentius also started the book carrier movement, printing illegal Lithuanian books overseas and smuggling them back into the country via book carriers. In 1887, he worked with several priests and clerics, forming the Society of Lovers of Lithuania. 
This society produced illegal religious magazines and publications and funded its distribution. They got these books across Germany's border from East Prussia, or local priests themselves will translate the texts. But the operation really scaled up when Bishop Motiergis Falanchis funded a printing press in Prussia to print more Lithuanian prayer books and other books on Lithuanian history and culture. There were hundreds of Lithuanians involved in the book carry movement. Of course, as the years of the operation went on, the risks and penalties for being caught intensified. The Russian security had several lines of defense to catch those smuggling banned materials. Those who were caught by Russian security were tied to a post and whipped, then imprisoned or sent to Siberia. Those who tried to escape were shot. As reported by Yozas Vaisnora, in the book titled The 40 Years of Darkness, Lithuanian women would disguise themselves as beggars and shove their legal books in their sacks of cheese, milk and bread or dress themselves as craftsmen, padding themselves out with Lithuanian newspapers under thick clothes. One notable book carrier was Pastor Martinez Zedovicius, who spent all his savings on printing and distributing books. He took his horses and other horses on long journeys village after village across southern Lithuania, meeting up with local farmers who would help hide and share the banned books throughout Lithuania. He never took a day off, even if the weather was bad or if it was a very dark night. Martinus Zedovicius was also a writer himself and helped produce Lithuanian dictionaries and also founded the Lithuanian Language Institute. In 1875, the leader of the book carry operation, Valanches, died, and 11 people in the operation were caught by Russian officials. But under Valanches, his effort alone contributed to over 19,000 books being printed and smuggled. This successfully established a momentum and a huge way of even bigger book smuggling operations proliferating across Lithuania. Notable Book smuggling societies included Morning Star, Stimulus, The Truth and the Ray of Light, which smuggled Lithuanian language books across the world, reaching as far as the United States of America. All kinds of secret Lithuanian books were on the market, including textbooks, yearbooks, science and fiction books. Valencia's successor, Jorgis Bielenis, in 1885, created the largest book smuggling operation in Lithuania and was crowned the king of book carriers. He led thousands of Lithuanians to invest in buying up books from Prussia and set up a subscription service across Lithuania. So successful, he also reached Lithuanians living in Latvia. By the 1890s, Russian officials put a bounty to catch Bielinus, who successfully dodged being captured. Bielinus even created a local Lithuanian newspaper called the White Eagle and printed it in Lithuania by smuggling a whole printing press into Lithuania from Prussia. The estimates for how many Lithuanian books were smuggled is likely underestimated. As in legal activity, it was really hard to track. Between 1891 and 1901, over 173,000 books were confiscated and destroyed by Russian officials. But in the last years of the Lithuanian language ban, 30,000 to 40,000 books were crossing the border every year. The Lithuanian spirit to preserve its culture, history and language was a significant watershed moment to enable the Lithuanian people to dream for independence. Through the 1880s and 1900s, choirs, plays and newspapers discussing political independence were popularized, igniting the Lithuanian national identity. The more Russian officials attempted to suppress the movement, the more the Lithuanian people rose against it. For example, some Lithuanians exploited the loophole for banning Lithuanian language by carving writings on clay, as these weren't technically books by Russian policy standards and thus were not illegal. The Lithuanians were unstoppable and successfully organized local board meetings against the Russian government to overturn the ban. In 1897, the Russia's Council of Ministers declared the language ban a failure 
and rescinded the ban in 1904. The story of the book carriers is an inspiring tale and truly showcases the fighting spirit which shapes Lithuania's identity today. You can visit the Book Smugglers Yard in Kalnis, which commemorates the book smuggling operation, including a wall of names of the known book smugglers. We would like to thank Michael Warder's article, The 19th Century Lithuanians Who Smuggle Books to Save Their Language, for many of these book smuggling stories. World War I changed everything. In 1915, Germany had successfully defeated the Russian army in areas around modern-day Lithuania, Latvia and Belarus. While Russia withdrew from the war entirely in 1917 due to its Bolshevik revolution. After Germany's defeat in World War I, Germany was keen to negotiate with Central European countries for an economic and political union to create stability and weaken the economies of Western European rivals. Lithuania jumped on this and negotiated for Germany to declare Lithuania's independence. The Act of Independence of Lithuania was signed in Vilnius on the 16th of February 1918 by 20 elected Lithuanians of the Council of Lithuania. The declaration unanimously stated, The Council of Lithuania as the sole representative of the Lithuanian nation, based on the recognised right of national self-determination and on the Vilnius Conference's resolution of the 18th to 23rd of September 1917, proclaims the restoration of the independent state of Lithuania founded on democratic principles, with Vilnius as its capital and declares the termination of all state ties which formerly bound this state to other nations. The Council of Lithuania also declares that the foundation of the Lithuanian state and its relations with other countries will be finally determined by the Constituent Assembly and convoked as soon as possible, elected democratically by all its inhabitants. And that's where we will leave it for part four of the history of Lithuania. Any questions, feedback, please leave it down below and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.